Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good, good. good to see y'all. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Bias Blood Ministry this morning. Everybody's here. Everybody's watching from home. This morning I'm reading out of uh, 2 Peter, starting in uh, chapter 3. It says, this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by the way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, the scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the the fathers fell asleep. All things are continuous as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of the water and through the water by the word of God. And that by the means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach a repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for God's patience. Yes. I'm thankful for his timing. It says that one day is like a thousand years. And a, thousand, a thousand years is one day. I know we're all going through different seasons of our life. And you might be like, where's God at? 
great thing about him, he doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. He he never stops fighting for each and every one of you. He's continuous and working out the things of your life. So don't be discouraged. Be thankful for his grace and the patience that he's showing for you. Because it says it. He doesn't wish for any of us to perish. He's being patient out of love for us. Everything that we know and that we see, one day is going to pass away. It says it'll come like a thief in the night. So I, my prayer this morning is that you prepare yourself for his return. Only, only the Father knows. He can come as I'm standing here speaking. So let's pray. Father God, we're just humbled to be here. We're so thankful for your love, your mercy, and grace, your patience, your loving kindness, your faithfulness, your trustworthiness. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for taking the penalty of your, our sins on yourself and dying on that cross. Thank you for the atonement that you offer through your precious blood. I pray if anybody's here today that has never accepted you, God, these altars are open. I pray that you would minister them today. I pray that you would touch their hearts and minds. I pray that something would be said today that would stir up a, a fire of faith inside of them, Lord. I pray, Lord, uh, if there's any here that's broken, that's backslid, that's just going through a season, Lord, I pray that you would minister to them. I pray for healing for those that need healing. I pray for freedom to, for those that need freedom, Father, whatever it may be, Lord. God, we just want to draw close to you, Father. We know that you'll draw close to us. We welcome your spirit to just move freely through here. Let there nothing be a distraction. God, we just want to give you all the, the praise and honor and glory that you deserve, Lord. Pray for the praise and worship, Lord. We just pray for the, the, the preaching of the word, Lord. Pray that it goes forth and just is um, just amazing to your ears, Lord. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I guess everybody can just shake hands and get to know each other. <laughs>
you be the focus of all things that we do, Lord. You're the source of our life. You're the source of all of it, Lord. We thank you that you are the purpose. You are the prize at the end, Lord. We thank you that we run. We run. Keep singing, Shirley. We run to you, Lord. We run this race. We run this marathon and we won't quit. We get knocked down. We get back up. We thank you, Lord, that you are our focus. Thank you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Uh, if you don't mind, go ahead and give our praise and worship uh, team a, a big hand. <laughs> they come in every week and, uh, and, and pour their hearts out and uh, pour their hearts for the Lord and allow the Holy Spirit to be stirred in here. And, uh, you know, they, uh, they never ask for anything. It's amazing. I think that... Uh, as deep as it's gone, as I think uh, Richie asked for some new strings for the bass. But uh, other than that, no, I mean, we're pretty good. No, y'all, uh, y'all do an outstanding job, and uh, much appreciated. Um, if I could get JD and uh, Craig to the front, please. This is our time of offering, and uh, you know, those of y'all that have been here before, I apologize. We worked on the mic, so I'm trying to figure out the range here. I just uh, turned it up a little it's bit. It's all good. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a time of, of offering. And as we've talked about many times, it's not just tied to our wallets. I mean, what has God given you this week? What is it that, uh, that God's poured into you that needs to be poured back into his community, back into his kingdom? Um, if we limit ourselves to just a monetary gift based upon what the Lord has given us, we're never going to get there. Uh, we'll never be able to pay the Lord off to begin with. But... Uh, but, but he sees he sees our hearts, and, and it's it's much more than money. If money is the only thing that your heart is consumed by, then we've got a lot more to talk about than just the gifts that you've been given. So, you know, during this time, this is something that, uh, that we should come in here prepared and, and ready for. Uh, complete knowledge of, you know, the Lord has given me this, and I need to put this back into his kingdom. Guide me how. And uh, so, so that's where we are, and uh, we have been just so tremendously blessed to receive these things because these are not things that the Lord has to give us. There is no uh, no law in, in Scripture or in uh, in humanity that says God has to give us blessings, but uh, it is what He does, and He does so uh, abundantly. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's honor Him with this uh, this time of giving. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, and Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to put back into your kingdom, Lord. Lord, you have poured into us, you have brought us to places that we never knew even existed, and we thank you. 
We thank you for the journey. We thank you for the hardships. We thank you for what it took to get us here, Lord, because it allows us to see your mighty hand. It allows us to see you work. Uh, it, it makes the, the fact that miracles do happen, uh, it, it makes it so evident, Lord. It makes it impossible to deny, Lord. Lord, we are honored to be your children. We are honored to be your people. Allow us to carry ourselves as such and bring glory to you in all things. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. 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 Announcements for the week on uh, Tuesday. We have the uh, Tuesday and Thursday. We have the high set people coming in to uh, to teach. As I've said before, you know the Lord lays a lot of things on our heart, and uh, one of those things that's, uh, that was laid on my heart, and uh, I know it's been laid on several people's heart here, is education. Education is something, uh, along with your faith, two things that can never be taken away from you. And uh, these ladies come in, they give their time. They absolutely charge us absolutely nothing. They charge absolutely nothing for the classes. They don't even make you bring paper and pencils. They provide that. Uh, so if you say, well, I just never had an opportunity to get my education, you'd be lying. Uh, because it's right here in this room, Tuesdays and Thursdays from 5 until 7, 7.30. Um, that is an actual high school diploma. It opens you up to the uh, benefits of Tennessee Promise and uh, many other programs that are that are given by the state. And uh, so, by all means, if uh, education is something that's been laid on your heart, there's your opportunity. Uh, also, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, no need for fear group. The uh, NA group they meet downstairs at seven o'clock. Tuesdays and Thursdays, it is a diverse and well-rounded group. I mean. Uh, you know, anyone who's been to a 12-step before, you know if you go in and it's a bunch of newbies, that's not really a great meeting. You go in and it's a bunch of old heads, 
That's definitely not a great meeting. That's a long day. <laughs> Guys, this, uh, these meetings, they have a good mixture, and uh, you will get to be able to, uh, to talk and to, to ask questions and to, to actually gain knowledge and move forward in, uh, in, in what it is that you're needing to accomplish. Um, on Wednesday, we have Holy Hump Day. That means at 6 o'clock we have a meal, and we will be having... We're having chili this week, so praise God, that is, uh, that's good eating right there. So, uh, Wednesday we will have chili, and then we will break up into our groups. Women's group, what are you going over? Yeah, the Lord will break it on my heart. She will figure it out. Uh, the youth, I know that they're starting a new lesson. We are still, men, we are still in the book of Judges. Uh, we are getting close to finishing. Uh, we went over the, the birth of Samson this past week, and, uh, exactly what the Nazarite vow was, because uh, I think we needed some understanding, some clarity on that, but uh, but we were able to get through it, and uh, it was great. Uh, not this Saturday, but next Saturday, we will have the laundry ministry. Uh, we had it this past Saturday. Um, it will be meeting at noon over at uh, the laundry mat across from Only Guacamole, and uh, it, it's just, it's a great ministry. It gives you a chance to, to meet people that... Uh, that maybe you wouldn't have met before. It allows you to discuss, you know, your testimony and, and where you came from and, and where you are now, and uh, maybe give some hope. Uh, also, uh, maybe be able to react to a need that's that's in that moment that uh, you now have the ability to meet or the ability to at least direct to the right place. So, um, once again, that's a wonderful and a great ministry. Um, and then next Sunday, uh, this coming up Sunday, we will be right back here again for uh, church service. And uh, I urge you all to come and, and all to be here. Those that couldn't be here today, let's be in prayer for them. Uh, we have some working, we have some that are ill, we have some that just aren't here and that happens. Uh, you know, but what we would like to cultivate is a church that, uh, you know, when you don't show up, ask them why they weren't here. You know, that's how it was when, uh, when you know, the generation before me and the generation before that was, if you weren't at church, they were asking questions. Not if you're at church, they're asking questions. So, um, you know, if the person that you usually sit next to, the person that you usually come here with, they're not here, just uh, just tell them that you miss them. Don't, don't hammer them over the head, but just let them know that they're missed because they are missed. They're part of our family and they're, they're, they're a part of our growth and our development and all things. So... Uh, Let's be mindful of that. Uh, you know, a long time ago, this was probably around 10 years ago, maybe nine, somewhere in there, I was doing a uh, Bible study. We had it every single week at Barnes & Noble, and I loved it until Barnes & Noble said, hey, Jesus isn't allowed in here either. Um, not, you know, not saying anything about Barnes & Noble other than they don't let Jesus in there. But um, this guy comes up. And he's like a huge critic of the Bible. And he's, he's, he's dead set to, to ruin this Bible study. I mean, he just came in and I mean, he was sour and sideways. And it, I mean, it was running all over me. And, uh, but we were able to keep our cool and, and, and continue. And we were actually in the book that we're going to be in today. We were in 2 Timothy. And uh, he, he proceeds to tell me how Timothy, the author of that book, was a good Jewish boy. And he, he gave me the history of Timothy and, and, and what it took for him to write that book. And, and I, I kindly just interrupted him and I said, Sir, Paul wrote that book, not Timothy. Therefore, all the other stuff that he said, it didn't matter. He proved himself to be in, he didn't have the knowledge. He didn't have the understanding. He couldn't even tell me who wrote the book that he's trying to tear apart. It's hard to go into a fight if you don't have the right weapons. It's hard to go into a fight if you don't know what you're talking about. It's hard to go into a fight if you don't know what your opponent knows. Well, we've been instructed to finish the fight. And we've been instructed to finish the race. That's exactly where we are today in 2 Timothy. Um, a letter written to Timothy from Paul. And Paul is giving Timothy instructions as to what he's due to do now that he's out there. Because the guy was right on several things. Timothy was a young man. Timothy was fairly new to the ministry. Timothy was going to be facing things that he did not know before. Timothy's going to be facing criticism that he had never faced before. 
Timothy's coming into a place that a lot of us are coming into, a place where he knows that Jesus is the Christ. He knows that the gospel needs to be preached. He knows that, that it's his job to bring understanding and to bring truth into the world. But there's a, a twinge of fear because he knows that it's going to be a fight and he knows that it's going to require endurance. And how does he know that? Because his mentor, Paul, at this point is locked up. His mentor, Paul, is not only locked up, but his mentor, Paul, is getting ready to face certain death. Paul's ministry, a, a large portion of it, was completed from prison, yet he never lost hope. He never lost faith. He remained strong in those instances, knowing that those things sometimes come when you put your trust and when you put your, your life in the hands of the Lord as opposed to the wishy-washy, side-by-side, whichever way the wind blows world that we live in today. Again, society has not changed that greatly between now and the Roman Empire. We could take westernized civilization and the Roman Empire and put them side-by-side, side, and it would be hard to see a difference. It would be hard to say, well, this society is superior to that society. We may have some different technologies, but... At the same time, they had their own technologies coming into play. They had their own things coming into play. They had their own critics. They also had uh, surrounding nations they had brought together, which brought in all kinds of foreign gods, all kinds of idolatry, all kinds of paganism. And they were fine with it as long as everything was good under the Roman rule. And then here come the Christians shaking everything up, saying, no, our life, has, our life should look like this. Not like what you're putting out there, world, but what, what we have been instructed by our Lord and Savior. So in this letter, Paul is not only giving Timothy advice, he's letting him know what's coming his way. And he's also strengthening Timothy through his own testimony and through his own words. So in verse 1, it says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. So the first thing he's doing is he is challenging, encouraging, commanding Timothy. And he's saying, I'm doing this in front of the Lord because the Lord knows my heart. The Lord knows that my, 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 my reason for this is pure. I'm putting this before the Lord because it's not me who is requesting this. It is the Lord who is requesting this of you. But you see, the thing about what, what, what Paul is telling Timothy is Paul's not just flying off on his own and saying, I prophesied last night and the Lord told me that this is you, Timothy. No, Paul reads through the, 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 the Old Testament and then he reads through the letters that, that not only he has written, but so has Peter that have not yet been canonized. And he, he, he realizes the, 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 the personal relationship that the disciples had with Jesus. He gets to see that firsthand because he's able to talk to them. He's able to build a relationship with Jesus' brother. He knows Jesus. He spent three years with Jesus. So he knows Jesus. And he knows that Jesus is not just saying this to Stephen. Jesus is saying this to you. Jesus is saying this to me. Jesus is saying this to all of us, so he might as well just say, I'm charging all of you, but since this letter is to Timothy, he's saying, I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus. So he's saying, my heart is pure in this commandment that I'm giving you. I'm not going rogue and telling you just what I want you to do. This is what the Lord has commanded us. And if we read through Scripture, we'll see that absolutely nothing that Paul says contradicts Scripture. We'll see that nothing that Paul says is contrary to the, to, to the life of Jesus Christ. We'll see that nothing that Paul says does not match up with what Christ has commanded us to do. So he says, God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. So God is the judge. God is the judge of all. Now, I mean, we all carry righteous judgment in, in certain things, but it is not my job, nor is it my desire to decide who's going where. I don't know who's going to heaven. I don't know who's going to hell, other than the fact that the ones that know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will be the ones going to heaven, and the ones that do not will be the ones going, hello, hello, will be the ones going to hell. 
because there are two types of people, the believer and the non-believer. So here's what he tells Timothy. He tells him first to preach the word. Guys, we have been instructed to preach the word of God. That doesn't mean that every Sunday you have to come up here and stand behind the pulpit and come up with a sermon or anything else. But how do we preach the word of God? We don't just preach the word of God with our mouths. Preaching the word of God with just our mouths would not really benefit anyone. Preaching the word of God with just our mouths could come across as just lip service. No, we preach God with our lives. We preach God with, hold on one second, let me get these, mark, these batteries in here and I will be even louder. I apologize. So as I was saying, we preach God. We preach, preach Christ with our lives. We preach Christ with our actions. We preach Christ with our deeds. We preach Christ because people can see that once we come to know Christ, we become something different. How many of, of y'all are even recognizable to what you were three years ago before you knew Christ? I've seen y'all change. I know what you looked like before, and I know what you look like now, but I also know that there's times where we, even in our growth, we get into this place of doubt. I understand that even during our growth, we, we get to this place of hardship. I mean, even, even in our growth, there's a time when we become complacent. But if we stay constant in preaching the word, not just verbally, but with the way that we live, the consistency will be there. But we have to wake up with that mindset. Every day it has to be, Lord, I am getting up and I'm going to preach your gospel. I'm going to preach your gospel through kindness. Yes, I am. I'm going to preach your gospel through knowledge. Yes, I am. I'm going to preach your gospel through wisdom. Yes, I am, because I've made enough mistakes where I'm one of the wisest people in here. A lot of times wisdom comes from, from falling. Or at least watching other people fall. So we've got to wake up every day, and that has to be one of our goals. One of our goals has to be, Jesus, I'm going to live for you today. Amen. You could easily take, preach the gospel, preach the word out, and say, I'm going to live for you today. Because that's what the gospel says. The gospel says that Jesus came for us. The gospel says that Jesus lived for us. The gospel says that Jesus went to the cross and died for us. The gospel says that Jesus resurrected for us. The gospel says that Jesus ascended into heaven and now sits next to his father for us. And the gospel says that Jesus will return for us. Amen. So as I'm living, my life should reflect the things that have been done for me. Jesus gave me love when I did not know him. Jesus gave me love when I was his enemy. So I am to do the same thing. Jesus gave me knowledge when I didn't deserve it. Jesus gave me knowledge when I was lacking. I should do the same thing. See, living and speaking are two different things. Be doers of the word, as James said. Not just hearers of the word. Amen. So every morning we're waking up and we are ready to preach the word. And when are we ready to preach the word? Well, Paul answers that in the very next sentence. He says, be ready in season and out of season. See, there's times if you look at, look at life and you look at society and you look at everything else, it's very secular. Things that, that were here, you know, seem like they're so far away, but eventually they come back around. Bell bottoms and mom jeans. That's the truth. Bell bottoms and mom jeans all of a sudden appeared at the beginning of 2024. And I was like, what is going on here? Oh, my goodness. But nonetheless, in season or out of season. So whether we're in a period of time that it is popular to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there's times where you're going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people are going to be like, yeah, preach it, brother. Preach it. And then there's other times that you're going to preach the gospel and it's going to be silence. Or it's going to be booing. Or it's going to be criticism. Or it's going to be critical thought. Or it's going to be whatever. And it doesn't matter if it's the good time or the bad time. We are to remain consistent. Amen. And we are to remain constant. 
See, that's a tough thing to do, though, because we have these things that are called feelings. Now, I'm not telling you to not have feelings because if we don't like pay attention to those feelings and we just stuff them in there, eventually everything explodes and it's not pretty. I've seen it happen in the mirror as I was looking at myself. So, so we need to be mindful that, that in season or out of season, we are to be preaching the gospel and we are not to change no matter what people think of us. I say, it, I say it at least 15, 20 times a week. If everybody liked me, I would not be doing my job. Yeah. And that's a fact. So here's the first thing that I will tell you is if everyone likes you, you're probably not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a tough truth. Now, what do we do with those people that don't like us? We love them. <laughs> we pray for them. We want the best for them, even though they may not like us. And quite frankly, we don't necessarily even have to like them. I can love you and not like you. But I'm going to love and I'm going to, to continue to push and continue to, to, to hope that something changes in your heart where you know Jesus Christ because it's not just his desire to see everyone come to know him. It's also our desire if we're true disciples. So we need to be constant in the preaching of the word. So every morning when we wake up, it doesn't sound like this. Lord, if it makes people happy, I'm going to go out and preach your word today. No, it just looks like, Lord, I'm going to preach your word today. And Lord, I pray that it falls on some ears that, that maybe didn't hear it before. I pray that maybe a heart is open. I pray that maybe something happens. But whether it is a, a hostile environment or a, a, another church or whatever, always be prepared to share the gospel. And again, that's not just words. That's your life. The most powerful tool that you have is your life, your testimony. I can refute gospel. I can refute words. I can refute the Bible. I'd be wrong. But I can refute it. I can argue it. Especially if I'm coming from a neo-atheist or from, from, a, from a, a cult or from a different world religion or whatever. I can definitely argue with you about the Bible. But I cannot argue what Jesus has done in your life. What Jesus has done in your life. What Jesus has done in your life. Because we get to see those things. We get to recognize those things. And how can I argue with you if you tell me that Jesus is the cause of that? See, but the thing is, we're, we're really quick when we know that we're around people that love Jesus. We're like, yes, Jesus brought these changes about. But then when we're around people that, you know, don't know Jesus, what it is is, I've worked really hard to get here. Wow, we're leaving Jesus out altogether now. No, in season, out of season. And what do we do? What do we do? What does God's word do? What does God's, God's way do? Well, it, it, it's, it's pretty simple what it does, but, but it's a lot of words. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. God's word takes us from one place to another. God's word gives us peace. God's word gives us quality of life. Again, something that we've shared before, but it, it bears worth saying here. We are not going to affect the quantity of our life. The quantity of our life has already been determined. Our days have already been numbered. Our days have already been totaled. God's on this and he knows everything. What we affect when we apply God's word to our life is our quality of life. Because God brings quality to our life. God brings two things that the world can never bring. And we've talked about them before, but joy and peace. Those two things, those two, those two states of being come from God. They cannot come from the world. They cannot come from any place but God. So when we reprove, rebuke, exhort, we are actually trying to improve 
quality of life. So we have to do these things with a kind and gentle spirit. And we have to do it in a way that, that, that the person that we are, we, are, we are correcting, the person that we are trying to guide, the person that we are trying to help make a disciple. Remember, the Great, great Commission is not make believers because believers are just believers. It's to make disciples, followers of Christ. Amen. So we have to understand that, that, that we are instructors, not commanders, not dictators, not judges. We are instructors. So we instruct. And what does an instructor do? An instructor teaches. But who are the best instructors? The best instructors are the ones that will, 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 will come and they teach and they teach with patience. Understanding that you're coming from a different place. And that you're going to another place. And that you want to arrive at that place. But sometimes it takes a little bit more for some than others. And it really dep depends on what aspect of our lives we are talking about. Because sometimes my struggles to get to one place in my life are much more difficult than other places in our life. So we have to understand that we need to be patient with the people that we're sharing the gospel with so that we can see them grow. You know the best way to do that? Sit down for just a moment and remember where it is that you came from. Because there's not a person in here that wasn't born into sin. Amen. I'm going to say that again. There's not a person in here that was not born into sin. If there's anyone here without sin, please leave because we're, we're going to ruin you. It's going to be awful. But I notice that no one's getting up because all of us have come from sin. So remember where we're coming from as we're teaching. That allows us to have the patience. It's a lot easier to be patient when you see someone make a mistake and instead of being like, oh, why can't they get it through their head? Looking back and being like, I remember when they were trying to teach me that. It took me 20 more times. See, we, we get awful complacent about where we are, forgetting that we weren't always there. But the beauty of it is, wherever you are, there's teaching. There is, there is reproof. There is rebuke. There is exhort. And there is patience and there is love for you as well. And you are going to go even further than where you are right now. No one has hit the pinnacle. No one has hit the top of the ladder. We can all continue moving forward together. And sometimes those things will come from the very people that you're trying to teach. So we need to be mindful of these things. Now he is telling Timothy this for a reason. And the, it's evident as we watch society, as we see things develop, as we, we watch uh, just... If we just watch the world, like if we were to, one of my favorite things to do is to, to just go somewhere and people watch. Y'all ever do that? A lot of times I'll pick out a celebrity or something. I'll be like, that's, they look like so-and-so, they look like so-and-so. It's fun to watch people because people are a great study in life. But Paul knows, as does Jesus, what's coming up ahead. Because it's the same thing that the Israelites did. It's the same thing that the Canaanites did. It's the same thing that every other people up until this point had done. It says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. And they will acclimate themselves, teachers, accumulate themselves, teachers to suit their own passions. I know a family. 2023 and 2024, they have had eight church homes. Eight church homes. Because they have certain things in their life that they're looking to be excused from the pulpit. They haven't found the church yet, but that's exactly what he's talking about. Is we oftentimes don't like the fact that if we're going to live the gospel, right? It takes work. So the natural way to do it is to go someplace where that work is not required. And that work's not required because the sound teaching is not there. There's parts of the gospel that are left out. There's parts of the gospel that are completely missed. 
There are churches out there that don't even read the book of John. How can you go through life and not read the book of John? There are churches that don't read the Old Testament. Paul tells us that every word of Scripture is breathed out by God. Amen. Not just the New Testament. If we don't understand the Old Testament, how are we supposed to understand where Jesus came from? How are we supposed to understand the need for Jesus? How are we supposed to understand who Jesus is if we don't read the book of Genesis? It's an impossibility. But you see, a teacher that is not sound will focus on the fluff, the things that make you feel good about yourself, and leave the other stuff out. Not to say that God's word is here to tear you down or make you feel bad, but it should make you think. It should make you reflect. It should trigger some type of change in your life. So if your desire is just to go get praised and petted, cool. But you're not receiving what God wants you to receive. You're not receiving the entire truth. And quite frankly, you're not receiving Jesus. Now that pendulum swings both ways because there's other people that, that take God's word and they add their own things to it. Scripture never told me I had to wear a tie. It didn't. Crazy, isn't it? Scripture, scripture did not tell me that I had to have a, a, a certain haircut. Not that that would matter for me, but nonetheless, it never told me. Scripture never said that my skin had to be a certain color. Scripture never told me that I had to, to have a certain type of sense of humor. Scripture never told me any of those things. Scripture told me that Jesus plus nothing is my salvation. Amen. See, but if I didn't read the Old Testament, I wouldn't even understand why that was important. So be careful and be cognizant of who you're receiving your information from and why are you receiving that information. Why are you seeking a new place to receive information? Are you seeking a new place to receive information because you just want to hear what you want to hear or because you're truly seeking more information? I can't, just, I can't tell you your motives, but what I'm saying is be mindful of what we're doing. Be mindful of what we're trying to do. If there's something in your life and you've been to eight churches and every single one of those churches is correcting and reproofing you on that, odds are you're in the wrong, not the church. Because we all read the same book. At least most of us. That's a conversation for a different day. And when they, they, they find the teachers to, to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. If it does not match God's word, it is not true. God's word is complete. God's word is living. God's word is inspired, inerrant, and infallible. So... When you find people that want to add to it or take away from it, it becomes a myth instead of a truth. It becomes what they want it to be, not what God wants it to be. Do you want to be a disciple of Pastor Scott or do you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? I pray to God it's Jesus Christ because if you're my disciple, you're screwed. Big time. I can't offer you salvation, guys. Truth, I try my best. I can't, I can't be God. And neither can anyone else. Jesus is our God. Jesus is our, our, our Savior. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the way. Jesus is all of those things. So stay away from those myths. Stay away from the things that, that are not true. Because you know in your heart they're not true. You know you're trying to manipulate the system. And then he tells tells him, he tells Timothy, just plain and simple, as for you, always be sober-minded. So always be clear-headed. Sober-minded is, is, see, everyone thinks that that's just drugs and alcohol. No, no, no. If I come in here today and I'm, I'm, I'm worried about something at home and I'm not worried about sharing the gospel, I'm not sober-minded in that moment because my mind is not focused on God. My mind is not focused on the mission. My mind is not focused on what I'm supposed to be focused on at that time. If I'm worried about my car, if I'm worried about uh, 
what my golf game is going to look like after this or, or whatever it may be. I'm not even playing golf today. But whatever it may be, if it's taking away from my sharing of the gospel, it's not where I need to be. I need to get back in that office. I need to pray and I need to come out here clear headed and sober minded so that I can do my job. I can do what God ordained me to do so that I can do my purpose, which is the same purpose you have. Share the gospel. How about that? All of us got the same thing to do. It's amazing how that works. Then he says, endure suffering. Guys, if you're going to be sharers of God's word, you are going to endure suffering. You are going to have friends that turn their backs on you. Especially in the backgrounds that we come from. Right? Christ, cops, they scatter like cockroaches. So you're going to endure suffering. You're probably going to lose some friends. You're probably going to be criticized. You might even be called dumb for worshiping God. KB talked about that last night in his concert. He said that, that people said that, that he seemed like he was way more intelligent than someone that would follow uh, an imaginary and suppressive God. Well, to, to me, that just shows blatant ignorance, someone that has not read scripture and does not know God. Because God is, if God is two things, number one, he is not oppressive and he is definitely not imaginary. Matter of fact, there's nothing more freeing, there's nothing more equalizing than our relationship in Christ because our relationship in Christ breaks it down to us being brothers and sisters in Christ. So be prepared to suffer. You are going to, to suffer if you do this long enough. And sometimes that suffering isn't even the suffering that you think you're going to receive. Sometimes the suffering is watching someone that you've poured time, energy, and love into completely fail. And then you're sitting there with your hands out like this, and you're like, what did I do, God? What did I do? You did nothing. You did what you were asked to do. They chose something. It brings to mind Samuel when, when Israel wanted a king. And he was so upset. And he says, Lord, the people have rejected me. And God says to him, he says, they have not rejected you. They have rejected me. So when that happens, understand that you're not being rejected. Who you represent is being rejected. To me, that's even more painful. That means even more endurance. I, you know what? You want to reject me a thousand times? Please do. Just accept Christ once. Amen. But sometimes it doesn't happen and it's heartbreaking. Do the work of an evangelist. That means that, that, that we're doing what we had talked about the past few weeks. That we're always coming forth and we always have in mind... You know what? This person may not know Christ, so I need to, to show them Christ. I need to show them Christ in my being. And then the last thing he says is he says, fulfill your ministry. See, we pray about these things each and every week. Whether or not they're taken seriously, I don't know. Some people, it is taken seriously. Some people, it's not because I can tell by the fruit that's being born. Your ministry is going to look different than my ministry. Your purpose is going to look different than my purpose. But the Lord is going to put it before you. Your ministry will be laid at your feet. Your purpose, if you ask, you will receive. Now, it may not be a purpose that you want. It may not be a purpose that you think you are qualified for. It may not be a purpose that you think that you even want to do. But God knows better than you do. A little over 10 years ago when I was asked to be a youth pastor, the first thing that came out of my mouth is that's a dumb decision to the pastor that offered it to me. Why was it a dumb decision? I was a new Christian. I didn't know anything. I didn't have college degrees at that point. I was just learning myself. But but he, he, he was very plain. He said, we've prayed about it. It's been laid on our heart. We can't think, we can't shake it. This is, this is where we feel like you need to be. So I took that chance and it, it is exactly where I needed to be. It's not where I wanted to be per se. But I can't live without it. If I were to say, you know what, I quit 
by his blood. And I quit 180 tomorrow, today, tomorrow, whenever, whatever day I decide to quit. I would have to do something in ministry. Because it's still my purpose. It's still my calling. So guys, if you're confused about your walk with God, maybe it's because you're not fulfilling your purpose yet. And maybe you're not fulfilling your purpose because one, you haven't asked, or two, because he's telling you and telling you and telling you and you're shaking your head saying, no, no. You don't want to be in the purpose that you pick. It doesn't end well. I know a lot of people that stand behind pulpits because their parents did or because their grandparents did or whatever. Those aren't the reasons that we become pastors. We become pastors because the Lord lays it on our hearts. They're not effective from the pulpit because that's not what they're meant to be doing. Not everyone's called to hear, but everyone is called to preach the word of God. Everyone is called to evangelize. And then your purpose and your calling, the rest of it, I don't know. It could be to be a helpmate, to be a good spouse. Believe it or not, that can be your calling. It could be to be a supporter, someone who, who lifts people up and supports and cheerleads and, and, and helps them along the way. It could be a counselor. It could be, it could be a number of things. I can't tell you, but God can. And I will tell you that your purpose, just to make fun of a bumper sticker a little bit, your purpose will coexist with mine, all under the umbrella of Christianity. Because there's one true God, and he's the only one that can hand out true purpose. So search for your purpose. And then Paul's going to close it out. And you see, Timothy, Timothy, we all have to have people that we look up to. We all have to have people that we learn from. We all have to have people that pour into us. We all have to have people that, that, that do certain things. I'll name a few of them right now for me. Vic Young is one. Pastor Pete Tackett is one. Um, Reverend Lester Latney is one. Uh, the late Reverend Charlton is another. We've got, I've got so many people that poured into me, right? And in, in exchange, I try my best to pour into other people. So you've got people pouring into you, so eventually you're going to have to pour out to other people. We see Paul's in a position right now. He understands that he's poured out to Timothy. He knows that Timothy looks up to him. He knows that Timothy is, is, is strong, but he knows that Timothy needs to hear these things because Paul is not going to be there very long. So he's giving his instructions. And he goes on to say in verse 6, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. Paul, who's been in prison, understands that the lunatic Nero, <laughs> he, 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 like I said, you want to talk about just mirroring each other, you know, westernized society. Leadership got a little crazy in Rome, too. Nero was a nut. Nero burned down Rome and blamed it on the Christians just to try to make them look bad. And everyone's like, Nero, why are you holding that gas in that match? But Paul knows that he's about to be beheaded by Nero. He knows that his life is about to come to an end. So he's telling Timothy, he's saying, my time is, is, is there. My time has come. Now that my time has come, it's your time to take the, take the torch. It's your time to move forward. It's your time to run. So Timothy's being instructed by his mentor, by his hero, by his friend. My days are done, Timothy. Someone's going to have to fill this hole. Someone's going to have to do what I do, and you're it. And Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And that is a fight. And that is a race. Those are two very good analogies for what it looks like when we come to know Christ. And just a, a few things real quick. That we have to understand whether it be a race or a fight. I'm going to use a fight because fighting is something that I do. Number one, you have to know that there is a fight. One of the worst things that can ever happen to you is if you end up in a fight and you didn't know it happened. You didn't know it started because you're probably knocked out at that point. Your fight started the day that Jesus called you into being his. Your fight started the day that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So you are already in the fight. So make sure your hands are taped. Make sure your gloves are on. Make sure you're ready because the fight is already here. Number two, if you're going to finish a fight, 
You have to participate in that fight. You can't just stand in the ring and expect your coach to talk you through it. You have to physically and mentally and spiritually participate in that fight. Otherwise, you won't be finishing the fight. Someone will be finishing it for you. You have to complete the fight. You can't fight just half a fight and then come out and expect it to be done. You have to fight all the way through. Otherwise, you'll get knocked off course. Otherwise, you will get trampled. You will get destroyed. But the thing about this fight is this fight, the prize is, is, is better than any other prize that we could get from any other fight. See, when we fight, we get trophies and belts and, and maybe a check or something like that. But when we fight the fight that, that Jesus has put before us, we receive eternal life. Amen. We receive life with the Father. We receive eternal peace. We get to remove tears and fears from our lives. It's a, it's a, it is a prize that, that I can't even begin to fathom or begin to describe in completion to you because it hadn't been described in completion to me either. I just know that it's greater than what I've heard. It's greater than what I've seen. It's greater than what, what I could even imagine. Blessing upon blessing. New blessings. I can't even think what a new blessing would look like because I've been given so much. So the prize is worth it. So understand that your fight has started. Understand that you are expected to complete it and understand that you can't get knocked off course. And it says, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, we talked about that at the very beginning. It says, Who is to judge the dead and the living? That same judge is the righteous judge that will award to Paul on that day that crown of righteousness. But you see, here's the beauty of it. See, in the world, we all get different things. In the world, we all get loved differently in accordance to our personality, to our ways, to our looks, to whatever it may be. And that's the truth. You know, every parent says, oh, I love my children equally. Yeah. I don't know about all that. It's a great idea, but the only one that can truly love equally is God. God does love us all equally. So the same love that he has for Paul is the same love that he has for you. And he's told us the same thing that he's told Paul. If you are faithful, if you know me, if you accept me, I am your salvation. And Paul closes out and he says, not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So to all that love Christ, all that acknowledge Christ, and all that know Christ, that is the reward that we receive for finishing the race and finishing the fight. So as we go out this week, let's be mindful of exactly what it is that we're doing. Guys, we've got to wake up with purpose every morning. And that purpose has to be to share the good news, to share God's word in word, action, and deed. That's number one. That's our goal. Number two, we need to develop that relationship with Christ so that we can understand and define our purpose. And then number three, any fight, any race, the Olympics are on right now. As you watch the guys run the, 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 the 4 by 100 they have been practicing for four years for that event. And it's over like that because those guys are fast. But they've been training and they've been putting in the work and they've been doing what's needed to do so that they can not only start the race, but run the race and finish the race. So we're expected to do the same thing. Don't be the guy that shows up at Barnes and Noble and doesn't even tell me the right author of the book that he's getting ready to criticize. Know what you're preaching. Get into your Bible. Read it. If there's a, something that you lack understanding in, there's several things you can do. You can buy a study Bible. You can talk to your pastor. You can talk to your pastor's wife. You can talk to the... Youth pastor, associate pastor, you can talk to 
You can talk to a number of people. But the answers that you're seeking are there. I'd be very careful about Googling those answers. Okay? You know, Google and gospel, not the same. <laughs> Believe it or not, just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. So this week, I really want to focus on those things, though. Those three things, okay? Number one, wake up and just give it. God, let me represent you today. Whatever that looks like. Whatever it looks like. Number two, God, reveal my purpose. Let me know what it is that you want me to do in your kitchen. Do you want me out there working a homeless ministry? Praise God. I'll do it. You want me to, to, to teach school children uh, the, the, the truth and the gospel? Fine. I'll do it. You want me to support my, my wife because you have a big plan for her right now? Boom. You got it. What is the purpose? What is the purpose? And the purpose may change throughout time. So we got to ask the question every single day. And the last thing is, be training. Sharpen your minds. Sharpen your spirits. Sharpen your hearts. So that when you come into that situation, you're prepared for the fight. Knowing our opponent is easy. Our opponent is all those who don't know Christ. And it's not an unfriendly rivalry because we're desiring the best for them. We're wanting their quality of life to go up. So as we do these things, let's be mindful to be kind, to be gentle about it. Yet, let's not waver one way or another. God's word is objective. Objective means that it is black and white, good and bad. Nothing, nothing in between. Gray areas get us in trouble. You put me in a gray area, it's over. And I know I've talked to most of y'all, both good and bad, and I know that if I put y'all in a gray area, you know how to maneuver in that too. See, what the world gives us is a bunch of gray areas. They're like, well, it really depends on the person. Okay. I mean, that, that just lets me get away with whatever I want. Thou shalt not kill. Well, the reason that I kill. Thou shalt not steal. Well, the reason that I steal. No. Killing and stealing are wrong no matter what. The reason I committed adultery. No, nope, adultery is wrong, period. It's a lot easier, isn't it? I mean, what it does is it takes away you having to think your way through things that you don't even need to be thinking through to begin with. It'll let you focus on the important stuff. So let's get into God's Word so that we know what that black and white is, so that we don't get trapped in those gray areas, and let's continue to move forward because, guys... Y'all have come so far. So far. And it doesn't matter if, if this is just the, 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 the first week that I've known you or, or, or if I've known you for almost a year or if I've known you for five years. I see growth in every single one of y'all. And I know the potential that's here. And I know what even this small group of people can do because I saw 12 men take it a long way. So making these changes in our lives can not only change this church, it can change this community, it can change this state, it can change this nation, it can change this world. If God is in it, it is possible. Y'all dig? Praise God. You got the prayer request? All right, guys, these are the prayer requests for this week. Now, remember, these are important. These are your brothers and sisters, and they are saying, hey, I trust you. I love you. I know that you pray. That's the first thing they're saying. I know that you pray. I know that you have a relationship. Second thing is, I'm trusting you with this because it's bothering me, and I need to let you have it as well so that we can bear this burden together. See, when we bear a burden together in Christ, it becomes a lot lighter. Um... Yeah, be in prayer for the overstreets, healing for Jonah and Draven, both of them, ear infections, craziness. Two little ones with ear infections, our prayers are with you, sir. Um, David Craddock and family, any update? Still going through chemo. Still going through chemo? Well, we'll be in prayer. We'll be in prayer. Be in prayer for Kelvin. Uh, let's just pray he comes home. Uh, pray for Tanya and our family, each and every person in the uh, program, yes. I, look, guys. Not only just the guys in the program, guys in the program, be in prayer for each other. 
lift each other up. I mean, what I just talked about is the dynamic that y'all could have in that house or the house is. Y'all could easily be lifting each other up. Y'all could easily be doing those things. But it's a half and half battle. Half of the people are trying to build up and half the people are trying to tear down. Maybe if y'all got on the same page, things would get a little bit easier. Amen. Pray for uh, Shiana Mills. Pray for Mark Sluter and Josh Towns. Always, always. Uh, be praying for peace. Peace I always pray for. Um, sometimes... Sometimes it seems far away, and then other times it just seems right there, doesn't it? Uh, Wheelock family, be in prayer for 180. Be in prayer for uh, Jose and Katie as they're traveling. And uh, guys, be in prayer for any unspoken requests. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for this day. And I thank you again for each and every individual here, Lord. Lord, as we walk into that place of understanding what it is that you're desiring for us to do, as we walk into the place of understanding what it is that we need to do, uh, let us let us be cognizant of these things, Lord. Let us make the changes that you have put before us, Lord. And let us see that quality of life increase as we, as we work for you. Lord, we love you. We give you honor. I pray that you be with all the requests that were received today, and I pray that you bless each and every individual here with safe travels. And, and Lord, just let us do this work cheerfully, and let us do this work to honor you, not for our reasons. We thank you. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen.
it's in the, it's on the passenger side in between the seat and the console. 